We it became the fastest growing franchise in the UK, and still to this day, it's the fastest ever. We, we got to 250 franchisees, you know, in, in, in the first year. I'm expecting to see 800 and something thousand in the bank, and, and there's like 250 grand. And then what she did, and this is absolute genius, although she did it through incompetence, I took the decision to, um, to take the business into a CBA. Bill, it will be the most powerful how-to that you've ever had on this podcast. This is the Leeds Business Podcast, and I'm your host, Phil Fraser. I'm a business sounding board. If you need someone to discuss your business problems with, drop me an email. I can help you find the answers. This week's episode is jam-packed full of great advice from my guest, Nigel Botterill, founder of Entrepreneur's Circle. But before we start, I have one simple request of you. Please hit the follow or subscribe button on the app that you're listening to this on. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so let's go. Today's guest is Nigel Bottrell, founder of Entrepreneur Circle. Hi, Nigel. Oh, Phil, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Now, first thing we've got to clear up, this is the Leeds Business Podcast, and Entrepreneur Circle is based in Soley Hull, just outside Birmingham. So how do you qualify? (laughs) Well, I guess the the, the short answer to that is you invited me. But, but I'm a Leeds lad. I, I you know, my, my roots are in Leeds. You know, it's where I it's where I grew up. Spent all my youth in Leeds, all my formative years. My career started in Leeds. My football allegiances are in Leeds, and uh, I would it would have felt very rude of me to turn down your very kind invitation. Right there you go. So Nigel, Nigel qualifies on the Leeds Business Podcast. We get to January two thousand and three. What's what's the trigger to to make you know Nigel twenty years employee? suddenly go, right, you know what, I'm going to run my own business. Uh, well, okay. Um, this is a, a potentially an interesting story. So I, um, I, I had, uh, at that point in time, I had three kids. And I've got four now, but one of them hadn't been born at this point. And um, my kids were all quite young at that time. And um, we were starting to think about schooling and stuff like that. And my wife had met some uh, friends in Solihull who were, shouting about Solihull School, which is a fee-paying private school. Now, I, I went, you know, I had no experience of fee-paying schools, neither had Sue, my wife, but um, but we thought, we oh, ought to be interesting, we'll take a look at this. So Sue booked a tour of Solihull School. And and so I left work early one day and uh, got back into to, to Solihull and we went and, and, and toured this school. And I was completely blown away by it. And I had no idea that schools had this level of facilities and uh, it was so different because for all of us, we, like, we all think we're normal and we think our experiences, whatever they are, are how, it, how it is for everybody. And this was a real eye opener. Oh my God, this is incredible. But having seen this and, I, and seen these facilities, I, I instinctively wanted it for my kids. But um, I'm looking at the thing, you know, I look at what the school fees are and in, you know, in, t- in today's money, they're kind of five grand a term. I've got three kids and so... Um, that's 50 grand a year and that's got to be after tax. So now I've got to earn a hundred grand a year to put the kids through school. I've got nowhere to live and nothing to eat, you know, and, and although I, I was very well paid at CPP, I, was, I had a six figure salary, but you know, it's that the, it, there's no way I would be able to put my kids through that school, you know, doing what I was doing. And, and I had had a little bit of an itch to do my own thing. I'm not, I've carried it for quite a number of years, but it was that tour of Solihull school that was the catalyst. And I was like, you know, if I'm going to do this, you know, and I've got to kind of do it now. And so I went down. I used to, what happened with um, with Hamish Oxton, who was the, the kind of owner of CPP, he lived in Chelsea. And I used to go down to see him one day a month. And, and the rest of the month, I, effectively, I had my own business up in York because he left me to it. But one day a month, I had to go to Chelsea and I had to meet with him in his, at his, um, his apartment, his flat in Chelsea Harbour. And I went down in December 2002. And, and I had a very good relationship with Hamish and we'd worked well for two or three years at that point. And I shared with him that my plan was to leave uh, in the middle of next year. I thought I'd been very fair, giving him lots of notice and stuff. And, and that I wanted to do my own thing and, and, and share with him what was going on. And, and long story, that, that whilst he was he was very supportive and it actually was all very amicable. But, but he said, Nigel, I can't have you as my MD for the next six months with us knowing that you're leaving. We're on this strong growth curve. He said, you will become impotent. He said, you know, whatever you think, uh, your head will start turning. Other people will find out. He said, well, I can't let that happen. He said, if you're going to go, I understand that. He said, but, you know, if you've made your decision, it's probably best that you go go at Christmas, which was like two weeks away. 
So I thought I had this kind of nice run, runway to, to kind of plan my new business. And it was somewhat thrust upon me in the final kind of, uh, in, in the final moments. And I, I, I remember going to Euston Station to get a train back up uh, on, after that meeting. And I was a little bit early for the train. I was browsing the bookstore in W.H. Smith's and, and this book caught my eye and it was um, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I thought foolishly at the time, because I'd not read the book at that point, I thought, oh, that's me. I was a rich dad this morning with this six figure salary, this big job. And now I'm getting the train home. I'm going to be a really poor dad because I've got no business <laughs> and my like, money's gone. And, and But that's why I was thrust into it. And um you know, but I mean, looking back, it, it was probably one of the best things that could have happened. Really, did you have a plan as to what you were what you were going to leave to do? Well, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I I, I knew about marketing. I'd grown businesses. I'd, I'd had impact at Cordwell. You know, I'd done a lot of good stuff at CPP, and I thought I can bring my marketing knowledge to to other businesses, and and I can build this business. Uh, uh, so essentially, as a marketing consultant, what I set out to to begin with. And I thought that's what I'll do, and and I set out to I'll I'll get I'll, I'll get myself ten clients who will each pay me two grand a month. That's twenty grand a month coming in. I'll run it. I can you know I've got no overhead, so I'll run it from home as it were, and that will enable me to do the things I want to do. That that'll get me moving and get me going. And um and the deal I had with with Sue was that I had a year to move a hundred grand from the business account into our personal account. Because 100 grand is what we needed to maintain the lifestyle that we had and have a, a chance of, you know, putting the kids through that, that school. And um, if I could, anyway, I did that, then I could carry on with the business. But if I couldn't do that, then I would bail out on it and I would go back and get a job somewhere doing something whilst I was still kind of employable. And But that clarity of goal, I think, was really helpful. And, and actually, it was easy. Um, we, we, I got to the 100 grand had gone by August. And it... it, it um, we started to build, but we 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 ended up tacking quite a lot. I mean, it's been it's a very been a very interesting interesting journey. Um, the, the 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 most interesting thing that happened in those early days, because um, what I did once I once I had that chat with Hamish and I settled on what was happening, I, I remortgaged my house, and and this was I think really a really smart thing that I did, and I didn't realise how smart it was at the time. But I took we had a bit of equity in the house, and so and this is you know twenty over twenty years ago. But I, so I took a hundred grand on a remortgage on the house. I took hundred grand of cash out and while, and I, I could fill the forms in whilst I was still employed because it says, are you employed? And I was at that time and I filled the forms <laughs> in. It didn't say I was leaving in two weeks and I, and I filled the forms in and, 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 um, and took the cash and we just stuck it in a, in a savings account. And, and it was there and the deal with, with Sue and I was that, you know, I wouldn't touch that money without talking to her about it. And it was there just to try and get us through and, but it meant I could kind of do stuff. And, and it was a real, because so many people start a business and they're bootstrapping it from day one. And, and when you are doing that, it, it forces you to do things that are not often not smart to get you where you want to get to. And, and this, this is, this is interesting when we, some people come on to talk to, I think probably in a little while that the, um, cause I, I also, from the very beginning as an entrepreneur, I always had cash to do the things that I wanted to do. So I, I could buy advertise, I could buy marketing, you know, I, I could do stuff. I wasn't profligate with it at all. I was very careful with the cash, but I had the cash and, and it's the real killer of so many businesses. And, and it actually doesn't kill the business. It kills the potential and squashes the potential and compresses what people can achieve because they're hamstrung to lack of cash. And, and I think it was, a, it was a smart thing to do. And I know that's easy to say now, and oh, it's very different now. And, you know, it's 20 years ago and things are very different. And I do accept that, but there is a lot of money around. And I think it is a, one of the big mistakes that a lot of startup entrepreneurs make is is they try and fund everything from revenue, and and that isn't how super you know successful sustainable businesses are built. Um, that you know that, that they they've got capital and they've got cash, they've got debt a lot of them from somewhere to to do the things that you need to do, and it's 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 not in fact it's rarely smart to pay for everything from revenue. So you that 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 hundred grand gave you the breathing space to to invest in the business and 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 grow it and then then drive that money that was going into the savings account to pay for the school. No, that's all. That's exactly right. And and I mean, for instance, it, you know, and it, it also I said, you know, I set out to get myself ten clients, pay me two grand each. Now uh, there were people in the early months who um, I met that wanted my services, but they couldn't afford a two grand a month. You know, or or what to pay, and, and and if I hadn't had the cash to fall back on, 
I'd have taken those clients on. And the problem when you do that is that you, you take clients, but now, now, the demand, now they need the work doing. So now I've lost the capacity and I haven't got the money. And, and, and then and you end up in a vicious kind of circle. Whereas, and it protected me and it insulated me from that. And so I, I was able to pursue the kind of vision that I'd got. And I, did, I got my 10 clients at, at, at two grand. And, and, and we still had a lot of that 100 grand left. I, I never got, didn't even get through half of it. Um, but I mean, one of the things I did, I got, I got an invitation um, to go to a, a conference in America. Yeah, about six months in, and uh, and it sounded great this conference, and I really wanted to go, but it was going to cost me two or three grand to go to this conference, you know. And I've been on to it for six months, and and I hooed and hard about it for a long time. I, I ended up ringing my dad up, who was, as I said, a police officer, he was not an entrepreneur, and he gave me very wise advice, as he did in you know many times in his life. But you know, he, he said, I, "Look, you've um, you know, you've taken a big leap and set this business up." He said, "It seems to me that this you know two or three grand isn't going to." kill you it's not gonna uh, you know you might get you know you might find things when you go into that country will be very very helpful I, you know I, I think you should go and it was like I got permission from my dad you know I was like 38 years old uh, <laughs> but my dad said I could go so I threw the three grand out and bought the tickets and, and went and the, but that conference genuinely that that conference changed my life un, un, no question about it whatsoever and I because I discovered things that I had just had no comprehension the whole information marketing kind of industry, which was not, I wasn't even aware of at the time. Um, a lot of the cutting edge marketing techniques because the Americans are so much more progressive than we are. And I, and I, I went, oh, it was an incredible experience at this, at this event. And I met people. Um, I joined a mastermind group. I'd never even heard of mastermind groups. You know, like, oh my God, I found this. And, and then I said, so I ended up going to America. You know, I used to go half a dozen times a year um, just to get stuff to feed, intellectually feed, me and to feed the business and a lot of what we achieved in subsequent years was because of that development and that that, that, that kind of came from that trip and and a lot you, know, you can track everything back all these things wouldn't have happened if you hadn't you know um and and one of the things that we, we did my um my wife you know she, she she'd been a full-time mum for seven years until i um you know packed the job in at cpp and started on my own and she wanted to do something to help with the um you know, the kind of family coffers but she didn't want to go get a job and and she set up a local community magazine um like a little parish magazine really but she took advertising from people and she did a great job with it it was really it was really successful and it was pulling in a couple of grand a month which was really really very helpful in those early 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 years and then we had this notion that we could help other people to do what she'd done and 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 we kind of put this program together and and, and again i was able to use 100 grand so once i've got this program together i, I um I spent a little bit of money and built a website um, for this program. And having built the website, I became one of the very first customers in the UK of Google um, using Google Ads back in the beginning of 2004 when I, I was paying like you know one pence a click <laughs> and, um, and 2p was a really expensive click. But we were getting, but but I had the budget because I had the cash to, to do that, and and my mag became a phenomenon. My mag, my mag was our first real big kind of breakthrough business, and um, that uh, that was extraordinary. From from our back bedroom, what, what we ended up doing there, we sold a program for three three thousand pounds that, that helped people to set up and run their own local community magazines, and we set up over two and a half thousand magazines over the course of three years. Um, it brought us in over six million quid. And, and and it's what's what's lovely actually is that some of the customers are still customers today. They're still members of Entrepreneur Circle. Their magazines are still running, you know, and, and the magazines changed their lives in a in a really because you know, they were able to. Uh, so that was a, it was a big it was a big deal was that. But all that came from having that remortgage. Sorry, I'm talk a lot. I'll shut up. No, 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 no. Look, I mean, you know, you've just you've just dropped in there. <laughs> talking about setting up your own business then you just dropped in oh this side hustle we created out the back bedroom created six million quid that's yeah that's not bad going that is what so, it is that is exactly what happened it was it was a, yeah. it was a really really weird time um and but I, you know, was that, and was that very much a case of it. sorry i was going to say was that very much a case of right place at the right time Oh, unquestionably, there was a large element of that in it. Yes, no, no, but no question whatsoever. I, I've been fortunate enough for it to happen three times to me in my career. That was the first time it happened. When you catch a market at exactly the right time, and and when you know the demand is there, and and the challenge is actually fulfilling the demand rather than actually going out and getting the demand. And when you get into yourself in that situation, 
as, as an entrepreneur, it's just a, a really beautiful thing. Yeah, it's the, it's the, the rising tide raises all ships, isn't it? I mean, we, we, we had the same with our online bingo business. It's the right place, right time. You just, the market explodes, so you just take part of that market. Now, you just dropped in there. You know, you did it a couple of other times. So, so a couple of times you've hit, you've hit the right way. Three times you've hit the right wave. Tell us about the other two then. Well, well the, um, the, the, we made lots of mistakes with my mic. And we sold these packages and the, I had no, there was no continuity income. So no one, so once they'd bought the package, there was no other money coming. If, I, if I'd licensed the areas, even for a very small, you know, annual fee, it, it would have been a much bigger business and would have been you know, much more successful. Um, so that was a big learn. And and at that time, this is 2004, 2005, you know, the world is um, is starting to go online properly. You know, we, we still have the old dial-up internet, which um, lots of people remember, uh, unless of course you're under 40, in which case you won't have a clue what we're talking about. But the um we had but, but I wanted to we know, had the man on we had the man on who set up free servers one of our first guests on here oh wow yeah fantastic. ajaz ajaz ahmed listen to that one if 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 people haven't yeah. listened to that episode this is the man who pretty much invented the internet for the uk so look up ajaz ahmed free serve yeah. anyway sorry carry on nigel sorry so, well no so so we um but i thought is there a way to take the best of the magazines and bring it into an online environment and so we're creating, I wanted to do it properly. So I created this franchise business uh, that we called the best of. And the, the, the motion is that the franchisees would find the best businesses in their area, their town, and we would showcase them online. So we were taking small businesses online. And this was the second time we did it. And we it became the fastest growing franchise in the UK. And still to this day, it's the fastest ever. We, we got to 250 franchisees, you know, in, in, in the first year and took it up beyond 500 in the second year. And, and so we had this big national coverage, um, tens of thousands of businesses. And we would we were putting businesses online. We called them webverts, um, is what given them a page on the best of website. You know, before Google did anything, all Google business pages weren't around and Google local, none of that stuff was happening. And and that's that was the second kind of wave. So these were two big waves that all within within really um 18 months of each other. So we were really kind of riding high, um, you know, oh five, oh six, oh seven, and the best of was. I mean, it's still around today. It's a much, um, it's a much more modest business today because so many things have have changed in that in that space. But it is it is still around today. Uh, we've got you know a couple of dozen franchisees that have got very strong businesses that support in the local, the local communities, and then the the third kind of way that we that that. Um, that, that happened came through through Entrepreneur Circle, which really is where I spend all my time now. So Entrepreneur Circle started by accident. You know, this is can I tell you this story briefly? Yeah, this is you like this one. So so in two thousand and eight, so obviously we had the big melt financial crisis, the big meltdown, and I thought as a responsible franchisor, I ought to try and help my my, my best off franchisees to um you know to cope with the the, the downturn. So. I put together something that I creatively called recession training and invited the franchisees along. We had a training center in house at our offices in the Midlands and um, put on two dates. And the first date came and lots of them came and they enjoyed it. Uh, but there was still a big bunch hadn't booked on this training. So I said to my team, I said, look, when we do this second event tomorrow for the other next bunch that are coming, when they finish at the end of the day, be at the bottom of the stairs with a video camera and just film them coming down and ask them what they'd say to their colleagues that hadn't come on the training. And so they did that and they cut it together, nice little video, five minutes long, about why she come on this training. And But rather than send it out to the couple of hundred franchisees that hadn't come on the training, the, 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 my colleague at the time, she made a mistake and she sent it out to the customers of those businesses. And then what she did, and this is absolute genius, although she did it through incompetence and people to this day don't believe it. This is absolutely what happened. So she sent this email out to all the, to about, it went out to about 15,000 people and um, that it shouldn't have gone to. And, and so she, what she did, she realized what she'd done. And in a panic, she sent a follow-up email five minutes later saying, oh, sorry, <laughs> that last email wasn't for you. It was for our franchisees. Please don't watch the video. Which of course, <laughs> so what, which, you know, I wish I'd had the, you know, I wish I'd been smart enough to think of this as a campaign because it, it really would have been genius. But because thousands of people watched this video that were not meant to watch the video, and and we got the usual smattering of this is a disgrace, how dare you sort of thing send me this, and a few people saying I hope you don't get into trouble. But in there was was a, a bunch of people saying it sounds really useful this training, can we get on it? 
And so that was the first time that I started, we ended up doing, never, never wanted to miss an opportunity. We did three events, one in the Northwest, um, one in the Midlands and one in the Southeast. And, and we ran it for customers of, of, of the best of. And we ran kind of a recession training uh, for them. And it was the first time I'd gone out and spoken and dealt with anybody that wasn't one of my franchisees. And it was revelationary for me because, I'm going back to what I said earlier, because we all think we're normal. And, and I just thought, I never processed it properly, but I, I just thought, well, everybody that starts a business must do all they can to, you know, get all the cutting edge techniques and use all the clever marketing to develop and grow. And of course, that's just not the case. And so I went out and talked about stuff that to me was really obvious and really straightforward and things like Google Ads, for instance. And, and, and when you've not, when you don't know about these things and they, they it's, it's amazing, it's amazing. It's really this tremendous reception. And, oh, goodness me. And this really was when this was the point of conception for what became Entrepreneur Circle. And, and so we, we did some more events that year. And, and, and then I, I, we, we built Entrepreneur Circle and then launched it as a, an organization to educate and help and inspire business owners to achieve more than they ever thought possible. That's, that's kind of what was the whole concept. And it just we, our core area is getting and keeping customers. And, and, and so we, um, we, we launched this and, and in 2010, we launched this and, and it was fantastic. And within, you know, within a matter of a few weeks, you know, we had, I launched it by a webinar, um, on a, a Wednesday evening in March, 2010. And that evening we, we had our first 500 members, people signed up and, uh, and, and joined and we kept the marketing going and it quickly grew. And, um, and then we introduced, we started to develop it and grow it and it became, you know, very quickly. You know, the, the largest membership organization in the country that is, is just dedicated to helping businesses to grow. And but um, people pay a monthly subscription, but they um, there's no contract. You know, people can come and go as, 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 as they please. And um, and then, of course, what happened, you know, it ran very well for 20 years. It, it became my main focus. The team grew. There's about well, there's just over 50 staff at our head offices now in, in, in the Midlands. And, um, and it was all going well. And until um, uh, until you know Boris announced the lockdown, and like every business owner around at that time, you know um, I, I I went to bed that night, you know um, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life because clearly I'm going to lose the business I've got now. Um, you know everyone's going to everyone's going to leave because none of us and people forget now because there was that window of time of, of, of three or four weeks with there was no furlough scheme for anyone after you know, lockdown was announced there was nothing so no for no bounce back loans there was there was, there was no support for a, a period and and it's what's going to happen and um <laughs> and i had to go pick up my, my son had started working he was working in london and and he rang up and, and said look you know we're, we're, we've all got to you know work from home can i can i come home rather than this, this, this fairly dingy flat that he was uh, renting at the time i said i'll come for you so I, uh, I drove down to Clapham to pick him up, and it was that was a weird drive because it was one of the you know the, literally nothing on the roads at all. It was like a like I was in a movie or something, and got to his house, picked him up, and uh, we're coming straight up the motorway and we're chatting, and he's asking about what's happening with Entrepreneur Circle. And so I think it's going to die, and, and we're chatting it through, and um, we had we were one of the first we, had, we have a big annual convention every year at the ICC, and it was scheduled to happen that weekend. I think from memory it was like a Monday night when Boris announced the lockdown. And our event was due to happen like on the Thursday and Friday. So we were like the first event to be um, kind of shut down. And that was that, that of itself was scary because it's a big event, our convention. You know, there's like 1,500 people come. And it's it, in, in round numbers, it's a million pound event. But on the Monday of the week in which it's happening, what's happened is the million pound has come in and, the, and 950 grand has gone out. <laughs> and and now I can't run the event. And I'm thinking, well, they all can't come to the event. If they all want the money back, I, I haven't got the money the money's all gone it's you know it's been paid to the venue and to all the speakers and to all you know all, all the kind of set and all the av people and everything else that you have to do and so i, I you know that's that's going to kill me probably before all my all my subscriptions all my monthly subscriptions just just drift off and die so i'm chatting with my son elliot on the way back from um you know clapham on a completely deserted m40 and and we just start chatting things through and and um he's, he's a smart lad and we're just talking. And I figured that, well, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down in flames and I'm going to die. You know, my business is going to die spectacularly. 
because actually we do know a lot of stuff and we can help a lot of people. And and so I made the decision on that on that motorway journey with Elliot. Uh, I thought we'll we'll we're going, we'll do a virtual event, and we did it on the following Monday, and we spent twenty grand to promote it, and um, we had thousands of people turn up on this event. We made it free to anybody. We, we, we called it Operation Protect. I think you were there, Phil. You know, you, and uh, that time cause everyone we had loads of people there because. People had nothing else to do, did they? Everyone was at home. And, and so we had this massive audience. And, and what we said was, um, we, we hope we got practical ways to cope with this and things you could do as a business to, to, you know, to, to steer through these times. And I said, and, and any help you need, we're here for your entrepreneur circle. Don't worry about paying any money at all. Just come in and be a member for three months and we'll help you. And, um, and, and what happened was like, like thousands of people joined entrepreneur circle like that afternoon i was like fuck now they didn't pay any money so i'm still thinking i'm probably going to lose the business but but i'm now thinking cracky but if i could actually keep these businesses for three months in three months time and maybe the maybe this pandemic will be over by then or whatever we have at the we can really start <laughs> moving again so, so we moved heaven and earth just to just to be helpful and useful to people and and it, and it paid back in spades and was there still well over a thousand members that joined us over four years ago now on that operation protect that are still with us are still with us you know and um and that was the that was the third time although it's a long way to get to it that was the third wave because all of a sudden we had we we went from having you know it was always a decent it was a good size organization with ec a lot of staff a lot of people was a big business but suddenly that transformed us and took us to another level and, um, you know, and by, I think, doing what we did, you know, and, and, and we did go above and beyond during that time, that, 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 that helps us hugely. It's really, it's really, really interesting because I, you know, we often on here discuss with people, you know, how was COVID for you? And obviously, mm -hmm. lots of people were, it was a complete disaster. And then there's certain people, it was a big uptick. And obviously, you've got a huge uptick. And, and you're right, I, I joined and had three great months. And, and it's interesting the thing you said right at the start about, you know, normal and, yeah. you know, a lot of what you teach, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite experienced in marketing. I know quite a lot of stuff. So a lot of it was without being arrogant. Oh, you know, I've done that. Mm -hmm. Probably more reminder mm -hmm. than, than learning, mm -hmm. but there were so many other people going, wow, that's amazing. And yeah. actually for everybody who's listening, what Nigel teaches is absolutely amazing. And, and before we carry on and really dig into entrepreneur circle, um, I need to tell everybody or remind everybody about the Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. The Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal has two sides to it. My side of it is every week, totally free of charge. I bring you inspirational, motivational and fascinating guests like Nigel. Uh, your side of the deal, uh, dear listener and, and viewer, has two parts to it. Part number one, um, I want you to recommend this podcast to one other person that you think will get benefit from it. And part number two, I'd like you to write a review either at Apple Podcasts on the app, uh, at podchaser.com, or give us a thumbs up on Spotify. Or if you're watching on YouTube, give us a wave, Nigel, to everybody who's on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. And everybody who's watching on YouTube can see Nigel's absolutely amazing shirt. He's famous for his, his, his shirts. Um, everybody who's watching thing. on YouTube, give us a... Oh, Everyone on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and post a post a, a comment on the bottom of this. So, so that's the Leeds Business Podcast fair deal. Fair deal, Nigel. Fair deal. Fair deal. Right. Okay. So, you know, you've you've touched on and you've alluded to and mentioned Entrepreneur Circle. Tell us what entrepreneur entrepreneurs. It's easy to say. Tell us what Entrepreneur Circle does and offers to SME business owners. Uh, as I said, we, we we set out to to kind of educate and motivate and help and inspire business owners our core space is getting and keeping customers and that is the that is the space where we are genuinely world class but because to run any successful business sustainably you, you do need to do a bit more than just that and it's amazing you know so we our, our support stretches a little bit we're, we're very big on understanding and knowing your numbers you know the answer to any problem in any business can be found in the numbers so we, we work do we, we do you know, most the truth is most accountants sadly don't do a very good job with their clients it's not always the accountant's fault because the client doesn't pay me enough money to do a good job, but it's so important once you start to properly understand your numbers, 
it, it can it can liberate you. So we we we, we branch into other spaces, but the, the getting and keeping of customers is our is our core space. We've got local meetings all over the country. There's over a hundred of those every month. There's a really great meeting in Leeds. Uh, it meets at, it meets at Garforth every uh, every every month. Of our, our, our Leeds membership is is in there. Those meetings pull together. We run live events. We run online events. There's a, the our online vaults is um, has all the kind of step by step training that's, that that helps you to get you or your team to to get into the place where you're able to exploit um, you know the thing the things that matter these days. Because the truth is, for 70 years after the war, if you wanted to grow a business, all you had to worry about you took the biggest ad you could afford in Yellow Pages. You had a lot on word of mouth. And if you're a bit flash or really ambitious, you went in the local paper. But all that has changed in the last 20 years. It's completely different now. And there's so many more options and opportunities. And um, the businesses that don't know what they are and don't understand them and don't exploit them end up you know, not being as successful as, as they could be. And we aim to fix that. That's all we do, really. One of the key things I know you talk about a lot is the rhythmic acquisition of customers. Yeah. It's one of the things I think a lot of businesses struggle with. You know, oh, I've got a new client. Shit, I've lost my client. Oh, I need another client. And and just talk to us a little bit about that that concept of rhythmic acquisition. In many ways, it is it's like the holy grail in business because um, if you've got the right number of customers coming in consistently and rhythmically and obviously the rhythm is different for every business i always talk about we have um two, two examples i've got a restaurateur actually in, in south yorkshire in uh, he's got he's got three places in sheffield and barnsley so his rhythm he needs 180 people a day and i got another guy who runs a yacht refurbishment business and he ideally just wants three customers a year and and they're at the they're at the opposite now somewhere between three a year and 180 a day is your business, uh, almost certainly you don't need that many you don't need you know, and, and you understand what your rhythm is and well then where where are they going to come from what can we do and 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 stopping this kind of famine to fees because you're absolutely right oh, I'll do some marketing I've got some customers look after the customers ah oh, shit no marketing do some and and and, and that's <laughs> and this this kind of that's what it's like though for so many businesses and all that disappears when you get the rhythmic acquisition and there's lots of ways to it and it's not just about lead generation but that's important it's then about how you nurture and follow up with those leads because often people you know it's, so when they are ready to buy you're top of mind it's not about you know, pestering people and mean high pressure. It's just about smartly, you know, keeping in touch and working with them. It's about you. It's about being in the right place for them, you know, at the right time. We, you know, so understand, well, how many, what's my rhythm? What do I need? Who are those people ideally? And I know anybody could become a customer, but who's your, who will be the best customers? And how can we get in front of them? What do we have to, what's the message have to be? And then what media do we use to get that message across? And, and you start to build, you know, a congruent marketing plan. And you start to think then in terms of putting in place what we call marketing assets. And assets are things that serve your business for a you know, prolonged period. Um, we, are, we have at one particular campaign on, on Facebook, for instance, that's been running now since the summer of 2018. So we're approaching the sixth year anniversary. And this campaign has been running for six years you know, and we, we spend half an hour, a quarter on it, but fundamentally it triggers in and every week it's bringing me in customers and leads and inquiries. And, and that's what rhythmic acquisition is. And you don't, you know, never depend on one source, always have always multiple things. So we're insulated from, you know, bad shit happening somewhere. Um, and, and, and that's that's what the rhythmic acquisition is about. Once you, when you've got rhythmic acquisition of customers, everything in business is better, in, including the quality of sleep of the business owner. Because it's just life just is a lot better when you, you just know the next inquiry, the next customer, you know, is is, is there. Um, did that explain brilliant, that well enough? Brilliant. And oh. I, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, this isn't this isn't a this isn't a marketing asset for Nigel, but the, there will be a link to Entrepreneur Circle in the show notes, and I, I I can highly highly recommend it. Now, Nigel, you've talked about you know lots and lots of different successes, but I know within that career mm -hmm. there's been some dips mm -hmm. as well. So can we just just dig into some of those dips. Yeah, well, I, I there's, there's, there's one in particular that we should that we should delve into because I almost lost everything. Um, not not the COVID piece, but but uh, five years before that, and um, I um, we were riding high in the uh, you know, second half of 2014. We were doing really well, 
and I had a good team. Everything was, life was good. And um, my, my finance director came to see me in October and told me that she was going to leave at Christmas. And um, she told me some story about how her boyfriend said it was either her, you know, it was either him or the business. She was working too hard and stuff. And I, I swallowed that. And, um, and I should have been, you know, a bit more uh, tuned in. And my antenna work, they did tweak a bit. When two weeks later, her, her number two and also resigned and she was going to leave at Christmas. And so I was, I was a bit concerned, but everything looked like it was going to be, it was all right. And we were, at that time, I was managing the business in a very crude way. Although we, I should have had management accounts every month, but there was always stuff going on. And, you know, looking back, I only actually had management accounts twice in 2014. Uh, in two months of the year, not 12. And But the bank account was looking good. And, and we had this target that at the end of the year, um, we should have had £800,000 in our bank account. And and I finished um, for, I broke up for Christmas on the 17th of December. And we, I flew out with the family. We went to Mauritius for a fabulous holiday at Christmas um, uh, over in Mauritius. And I had a lovely time. And the last thing I looked at before I left the office on the 17th of December was the bank balance. And, and the bank balance was like at 775. So plenty, we're going to get there. There's, there's still a couple of weeks left. All, all, all is good. And so I uh, went on my holiday, you know, said cheerio to my finance team, effectively. I hired my new team, but they couldn't start until the middle of January. So when I came back in the new year, there's a couple of weeks when I've got no finance team, but everything will be okay. And I, um, I'll never, ever forget this as long as I live on the 6th of January, 2015. And I had to log on to the bank for the first time that year. And so I'm expecting to see 800 and something thousand in the bank. And, and there's like 250 grand. And it's like, oh, something must be missing. I must be missing an account or something. I'm not, you know, I'm, something's not quite right. Uh, but it quickly became out that it kind of was right. And um, and I don't, I mean, it was, it's a genuine, I had a physical reaction. It's like, fuck, where's, that's like all this money gone. And it was a real big deal because we had a, uh, our VAT bill was due to be paid the next day. And that was, that was like 280 grand. So like, it was like not enough money even to pay the VAT. Now I'd never been in that position at that point because I, Ever since I'd started, all those years earlier, I had me a hundred grand remortgage. I'd never had to worry about money, and and it took us it took us over a month with the you know, I had to get forensic accountants in to work out what was actually happening, what had gone on, and the, the finance team they, they, they never they didn't take any money uh, the, 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 as far as we're aware. There was no there was no fraud in that regard. But what had happened is we uh, we're a subscription business. People pay membership fees, and um, what, what had happened we, you know, we had a very imperfect system, and um, we, we didn't have a separate billing platform. We had our CRM and our, our account system only recognized invoices when they were actually paid. And long story, over an 18 month period, we had those three quarters million pounds that we'd not billed. And, uh, but the cash had all been accounted for in the accounts and stuff. And then things had just been a bit manipulated. And, but basically I had this massive hole. I had no, we didn't have the money. And, um, and and for that, for, 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 for five months, the first half of, of 2015, I got a real taste of, of what it's like for a lot of people running a business where you know, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you check the bank account to see what's come in, to see who you can pay. You know, and you, you look at which numbers you start to avoid on the phone when they ring you up because you know they're chasing you for money and it's just horrible. It's absolutely horrible. I hated it. And it's like a cancer. When, you, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're spending your time in business juggling cash flow, it is cancerous to growth because it saps all your energy. It saps your time. It becomes almost impossible. You can't, you can't do that and push forward. And it was just truly, truly dreadful. And, and I, I cannot go on with this at all. I had some terror. I mean, it was awful dark times. It really was. And, um, and, and I, uh, long, long story, but I, I, I took the decision to, um, to take the business into a CVA. Um, which is a creditor's voluntary arrangement. So you, you get, you keep full control of the business, but your creditors allow, you know, all the debt is frozen and your creditors agree to let you pay it off over a period of time. And normally in CVAs, the creditors don't get all their money. But I really felt it was really important, especially given what we did, that everybody got paid. And so in our CVA, the plan was everybody would get all the money, but I, I had five years to repay it over. And, uh, and I thought, I've been taking the decision, you know, that I was, it was all pointed out to me that if you do this, you know, you won't be able to get any credit, you won't be able to borrow any money. Um, and um, I remember the, um, 
the 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 insolvency practitioner because you have to have an insolvency practitioner involved to administer it and he was saying because the good the, the good thing is you don't have to tell anybody about it uh, it does it is a matter of public record and it, and it goes at company's house but you don't have to tell anybody i said no no i have to tell everybody he said what do you mean i said well, i can't have i can't have anybody having holding this over me i said if i if i do this i've got to kind of own it and 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 be upfront about it and and so we did, and on the on the fifteenth of June, because we got it all lined up, and then you, you strategize with this. And there was a there was a point when we went in, and 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 on the fifteenth of June, twenty fifteen, um, Entrepreneur Circle Limited went into a CBA, and I I did a video from from this office that I'm in now to all my customers and all my prospects, and I explained in quite a lot of detail um, what had happened and 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 why it happened and and, and where we were at. And, and we lost a few customers. Um, you find out I had there was this massive outpouring. Um, my secretary at the time, she did a brilliant job, and she collect. I've still got it. It's a it's a it's a book about two inches thick. Because I got so many supportive kind of emails, and so, which was really helpful actually, because that was a real personal low time, you know. But we but we we came, we came through it. And on the wall, you can't see on the camera, but just literally a meter away from where I am now, on the wall there is my proudest achievement in business because in October. 2019 um so it just over four just over four years it took us and that's there's a certificate on the wall for the completion of our cva and everybody got repaid in full and everybody no one lost any money at all and we repaid it all and we you know we we we, we came back and the old adage around um you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is is definitely true but they were really really dark times phil like they were horrible you know yeah. sat yeah. you know not wanting to go home because of how you're feeling, you know, and and then similarly not wanting to go to work. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's, there's a car park between me and my office, and you know, several times I pulled into that car park and just sat in my car and cried because I didn't, you know, I I just there were times when I just did not know how I was going to steer this ship through this. So I was how is it, how are we going to get through this? What we're going to do? Um, so it was absolutely bloody horrible. Um, but I think it, 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 you know, looking back now, I mean, I, I wish it hadn't happened, but it, it does help. You know, it's true that you, you, we're all of us the sum of our experiences, and in that regard, I'm definitely a, I'm a better entrepreneur um, without a shadow of a doubt. And I think I'm also more useful to my customers having been through that experience. Uh, Bearing your soul there, Nigel, amazing. Um, what would you say are, are your learnings and the learnings you'd pass on? To listeners and viewers from from that that situation. Oh, there's only there's only there's only one really a massive fucking thing, and it, and I mentioned earlier because the truth of it is, you know, at that point in time, I, you know, I I was not all over my numbers, and and you know this this eighteen months this went on, and and you know, <laughs> and and I you know the way I was managing my business, you know, because people forget like profit and loss accounts are works of fiction. Because we can manipulate them, we can do what we you know, they are. You know, we, you can you can I can bring costs forward, I can defer revenue, I can do all sorts on my my, my P and account. It's not real. The only thing that's actually real is, is the cash. And and the only thing that you know I, I wish hadn't happened is that you know my finance team at the time that they did manipulate that cash because they, they they knew something was wrong and they were they were fleeing the ship as it were. And because uh, they'd just got they'd lost control and got overwhelmed and they couldn't raise it with me. That I feel bad about that. Because I've obviously got an environment where they didn't feel able to come and tell me what what I do believe. You know, they, they, they may not know all of it. They knew, they knew there was a big problem there. But it's about getting to grips with your numbers. And anybody that's managing their business by looking at their bank account is is bonkers. Um, and certainly once your business gets to any kind of size, your bank account really is a very false measure because a lot of the money in there isn't really yours. Um, you know, you, you, a big chunk of it belongs to HMRC because you've collected the VAT, you've got to pay them at some point. You know, a big chunk of it is your corporation tax, which is on last year's money, but you have to pay it in a few months' time. Then you've got the rest of the money's got to go on payroll at the end of the month. It's not really your money. Um, but because when you start to get hold of your numbers properly, and there's a, um, a book by a guy called Mike Michalowicz, a book called Profit First, which is really a very rudimentary, very simple way for anyone running a business to think about their money and their cash and to run their business. And and you know, I wish I'd um, I wish I'd encountered Mike uh, many many years earlier. But I really that, that that that's the massive lesson is you have to you have to be all over the numbers. And we see it now in EC. I see people come into EC and you know they think that what they um, what they need is another 
you know, another 50 customers. But when you start to get, hang on, underneath it, the, the business model's completely fucked and they don't realise because they're not on the numbers. Um, so that that's the big thing by a country mile is your ability as a business owner. It's Business is a numbers game, you know, and anyone that pretends it isn't or thinks it isn't is, is foolhardy. Um, it's impossible to, to, to succeed sustainably until you've got a proper grasp of your numbers. Great learning. And as we're on learning and you're, you know, you're a training company, who better to give us a how-to than Nigel? And he hasn't told me what his how-to is. So this is as much a surprise for me as it is for you listeners. So Nigel, tell us about what your how-to is this week. Okay. The, um, I'm, my how-to is, um, is it, it will it will be i am very comf- confident with this uh phil it will be the most powerful how to that you've ever had on this podcast all right its impact will be more dramatic than anything else that's ever been shared and there's been some good stuff shared um uh, previously but um i want to i want to um share with you in like 4 minutes how to get your business to where you want it to be all right, which at the end of the day is, is what we all want as, as entrepreneurs and business owners. And, and I'm going to tell you a very brief story and that will just help kind of make the point. I'm going to try and do a, a really good job on this to get this across. Because um, when I started out um, uh, many, many years ago now, I had a, there was an old boy in my village who used to come and give me the benefit of his wisdom and advice. Uh, he was retired. He had a lot of experience. And, and, and I'd been going about three months. And he came around to see me one day. I'm having a cup of tea in my lounge at home. Uh, and he said, Nigel, what's the, what's the most important thing you've got to do for this business of yours to be a success? And I hated the question, horrible question. But I think well, somehow I've got to get, get enough customers. He said, I think you're right. I thought, phew. He said, so uh, when are you getting customers today then? I said, sorry. He said, well, you've just told me that the single most important thing for the success of this business, he said, which I happen to know right now, is the single most important thing in your life. And it definitely was because everyone had told me I was stupid, you know, leaving this career and doing my own thing and remortgaging my house. I had to make this work. He said, any sane, sensible person would have some time set aside each day to do the single most important thing. And I felt an absolute idiot, Phil, because I didn't have any time set aside. I was really busy, really busy. I wasn't lazy. I was doing all sorts of stuff, but I had no time set aside to do the important stuff that would move my business towards where I wanted it to be. And I started a habit the very next day, and I call it doing my 90 minutes. And I come into my office, and I'm a morning person. I'm usually here by about half past seven in the morning. And my door, office door is shut. There's a sign on my office door which says, do not disturb unless building is on fire. Nobody can come in. My phone is turned off. It can't ring. My mobile and my desk phone. I close down my email before I go home at night, so I can't even take a sneaky peek at what's coming to the inbox. And I've got a list of things that are for me to grow my business. And every day I come in and the first thing I do in the morning is I spend 90 minutes doing the stuff that will move my business towards where I want it to be. And what then happens is at nine o'clock in the morning, I emerge blinking into the light and I can deal with whatever the day throws at me because I've done the most important thing. And, And what happens for most people is they get stuck in straight into the day to day. And it's the day to day that kills dreams, Phil. And and this how to is if you can start to ring fence. Now, I mean, start with an hour if you can't do ninety minutes, but ring fence a chunk of time every day if you can get it so it becomes a habit. And my habit's been with me now for well over twenty years. And every single thing that we've achieved in business, if anyone was to go back and analyze it, what they'll find is we've done it all in ninety minute chunks. Because this is this is how you build a successful business, and all the other things, whether it's you know creating a business plan or you know putting your marketing together or getting investment or whatever else, it, these are things that the way you do them is in your ninety minutes. Uh, running your Facebook ads, testing Google, you know, you know, trying out this new direct mail campaign. I've had this idea of rewriting your website, doing some videos, whatever it might. All these things happen in the ninety minutes, and you, you create the capacity to get them done. And if you don't create that space, what happens is you get stuck in the day to day and the day to day kills your dreams. There you go, everybody. Start tomorrow morning with your 90 minutes. Nigel, you are so right. We all get so stuck in the weeds that we can't do the important stuff. I was talking to a client only yesterday about him. Well, 
our solution was to get more staff because he had to get so much shit off his desk. But absolutely right. Don't get stuck in the weeds. Do your 90 minutes. Now, before we finish... We we're gonna... The beauty of the 90 oh. minutes, sorry to interrupt, but the beauty of it is you can then get stuck in the weeds for the rest of the day. Because you've done the important stuff. That's fine. There you go. I've corrected by Nigel. Sorry, Nigel. <laughs> Nigel, before you do your shout out, um, I've got a couple of shout outs to do. Um, a couple of weeks ago, at a networking event, I gave away um, free Leeds Business Podcast biscuits made by the lovely girls from the Biscuitry. If you've not heard the Biscuitry episode, give it a listen. And I asked all the recipients to post a picture of themselves with my biscuits on LinkedIn in exchange for a shout out. So two shout outs here. Um, the first is Howard, <laughs> Howard Rushforth of Rushforth Creative. Uh, a brand visionary. So if you want your brand working on, give Howard a shout. And my friend Gary King, helping frustrated business owners to stop dithering and take the next vital step. There'll be links to Gary and Howard um, in the show notes below. There will also be uh, links to the two books that um, Nigel has mentioned. He's talked about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I can't remember the name of it, but the finance book. Profit First. There you go. Profit first, that'll be in the show notes as well. And as will Nigel's shout out. So go on, Nigel, who are you shouting out to? Well, my, my favourite Leeds business is uh, is Trust Electrical Heating. And and these guys are fantastic and they're so innovative. They're right at the cutting edge of, uh, I mean, fundamentally, it's electric radiators is what it is. But it's such clever technology and it's all built in the UK. And it, it's based out of Leeds. Uh, they're up towards Garforth is where their uh, offices are. And it's invented there and it's developed there and they're growing like Topsy. And they're such a massive kind of success story and such lovely people. And uh, the more people that know about Trust Electrical Heating and what they're doing, uh, the world will be a uh, not only a better place, but environmentally better place as well. They're uh, really, really good guys. There you go. Fantastic shout out. Um, Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Fascinating stories and some brilliant learning as well. Thank you ever so much indeed. It's been great fun. Thanks for having me, Phil. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring and of use. To make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, please subscribe to the show. Go on, do it now. Do it now before you go off and do something else. Thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, and don't forget our fair deal. See you next week.